Hello, and welcome to the Bamboo Lab Podcast with your host, Peak Performance Coach, Brian Bosley. Are you stuck on the hamster wheel of life, spinning and spinning, but not really moving forward? Are you ready to jump off and soar? Are you finally ready to sculpt your life? If so, you've landed in the right place. This podcast is created and broadcast just for you. All of you strivers, thrivers, and survivors out there. If you'd like to learn more about Brian and the Bamboo Lab, feel free to reach out to explore your true peak level at www.bamboolab3.com. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Bamboo Lab podcast. Let's dissect. As of this morning, we are now being subscribed and followed on six continents, 37 countries, and 795 cities across this great globe. So again, I just want to thank all of you Bamboo Pack members for your your followership, as well as your your reviews and the ratings and the heart letters that keep coming in. And thank you again for sharing it with so many wonderful people. I know you don't come on here to hear me talk. You come on here to hear these guests that I'm bringing on, these amazing people. And you're going to love today's guest. But before we start... We're going to share a heart letter that came in last week. This heart letter said, I loved your last podcast. Thank you. That was the first one I've, I've listened to. I'm so sorry it's taken me so long, but most certainly I'm on board now. That was so great and very inspiring. You're incredible. Bamboo Pack member, it's not me who's incredible. It's you and it's the amazing guests. So without further ado, I want to bring on and introduce a lady who has been in my life for many decades, and she doesn't even know. We've only met one time. She probably doesn't remember. It was at a book signing. I have an autograph that she she signed for my daughter. I still have it. My daughter's belongings in the safe here in my office. But she has been in my life through her amazing writings. We have Mrs. Sue Harrison. She is the author of six critically acclaimed best-selling novels. And I'm holding the first one in my hand, Mother Earth, Father Sky. The second one, My Sister, The Moon, and then Brother Wind. And they make up a series, a trilogy called the Ivory Carver Trilogy. And then her next trilogy concludes the book Song of the River, Cry of the Wind, and Called on the Stars. And that's her storyteller trilogy. She also wrote, wrote a children's book, not really a children's I think a middle reader's book called Sisu, which my daughter has a copy of that. We bought her that when she was quite young. Sue lives with her husband, who's a retired school teacher, and she gets the pleasure of sharing this amazing Upper Peninsula of Michigan with so many other blessed people. They are very blessed to have a daughter and a son, a daughter-in-law, and two grandchildren. She's also, um, you know, what's interesting about Sue is her, when she wrote Mother Earth, Father Sky, this thing took off. I think, and I'm not just saying this, I think every member of our family wrote, read this book. The copy I have is the cover's off. I mean, it's, it's in my hand. It's just been, it's been passed around a lot. That book really took off, and um, it became, I think it was uh, selected by the American Library Association as the one of the, nine, of the best books for young adults to read in 1991. And currently, she has finished up her latest novel, The Midwife's Touch, uh, Touch and I believe it's slated to be released here in February of, of 2023. So without further ado, Sue Harrison, welcome to the Bamboo Lab Podcast. Thank you. What a joy. Oh my I'm goodness. glad to be here. Oh, I'm so blessed. Well, I, you know, I don't know a lot about you. I know you through your writing, Sue. And, of course, we are, we, we are uh, friends on social media. So can you please share with the Bamboo Pack a little bit about you, where you came from? Okay. Well, I'm a Michigander. I was born in Lansing. My parents met at Michigan State University, where they were both students. And um, my dad was still in school, working on a master's degree way back in 1950. And uh, I was born. And then we moved around a bit in Michigan and then out to the East Coast, back to Michigan. And eventually my father uh, found a job in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where he'd always wanted to live, and where my mother never wanted to live, <laughs> and <laughs> we found a, a dad found a job as an agriculture teacher at the little town of Pickford in the eastern Upper Peninsula, and that's where I grew up. 
uh, went to school at Pickford, graduated there, uh, earned a degree from Lake Superior State University in C. St. Marie, an English degree, and uh, married a local guy. He said, uh, he said, man, I was the only girl in our class he wasn't related to, so... <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy, he got me. Uh, and his name is Neil Harrison. And uh, and then we started our family. And I knew from the time I was very little that I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to write books. And uh, finally, one day I did. Finally, one day I sat down and and started doing the research for Mother Earth, Father Sky. And I have a question. That book, and I've read Jane All's um, uh, K- The Clan of the Cave Bears, I believe series yes. back right around the same time I was reading yours and and I think her books are amazing but yours to me seemed so much more in depth it, 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 uh, did you have a, a a passion for this time in the historic in our in our history or did you have to start from scratch and do the research um I had to start from scratch and do the research I had I had a passion for Native American um information, Native American cultures. And um, when I started doing the research for this novel way back in the 70s, Jane Owl's book had not, Jean Owl's book had Gene. not been published. And so I thought, as I began to think about it, and I had read Alex Haley's book, Roots, yes. I thought, oh my goodness, if, if someone could just write a book that would make Native American people proud about who they were and who they are, um, just like Alex Haley did with Ruth, wouldn't that be wonderful? And um, there I am, a gal in the Upper Peninsula. There's no, there, there are no uh, computers. There's no such thing as the internet. You know, so where am I going to get this information? But I was inspired, and I finally had most of the book written in the early 80s and read a review in um, the Detroit Free Press, I believe it was, the Sunday Review, and it was about um, Jean Owl's Clan of the Cave Bear. And I just felt like someone had just <laughs> sucker punched me. <laughs> I thought, oh, no, somebody else thought of it first. You know, I might as well just quit. <laughs> and uh, But I attended a writer's conference in Escanaba, also a upper peninsula town. And there was a wonderful Michigan writer there, Gloria Wayland. And she said, you know, this world definitely needs Jean Owl. And by then I had read, read Jean Owl's first book and thought, oh, she's such, her research was so amazing. And the book just drew me right in. Mm-hmm. But Gloria said, you know, we might need a Sue Harrison too. You've got 400 pages of notes. You have more than half of the book written. Finish it up. Don't give up. And that was the advice I needed so much. And so I continued on. Well, I think the world, I think you're this person who shared this with you, that we need a Sue Harrison was accurate. I mean, I think, you know, how many international bestsellers uh, authors do we have, especially up here in the Upper Peninsula? So... <laughs> I, I I also like the art on the front of the books. I think there's such amazing oh. art, so vibrant with colors, and the fact that you you have they they the um, the characters in the books are such strong women. I mean, it just you really see in the books the the, the true nature of humanity that the, the 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 both sides, the bright side and the dark side, and the characters that you you created and brought to the world. But these young, these young and very uh, powerful, strong, surviving women, I, that's what I think will draw, will draw draws a lot of people to your writings. Thank you. It's, it's my goal, and it continues to be my goal with uh, the Midwife's Touch, also a, a very strong young woman's story. I think one of the most beautiful things that ever happened to me in my life, my husband and I were doing a research trip and we were on the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea, um, staying in a couple different villages over a two and a half, three week period of time. And one of the LU women came up to me and she was a very soft voice. Um, she worked at the library there. And she leaned over to me and whispered, thank you for making me proud to be Aleut. 
And I thought, oh, my word. Um, you know, it, it's it's like your heart letters, you know. It's, it just, it makes all the tough times and all the rejections and all the difficulties of writing the book. And you've written the book, so you know that it isn't an easy matter, um, no matter whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, whatever it is. Uh, it just makes it all worthwhile. Can you share a little bit and tell us about the Bidwife's Touch? I, I, I read I read it. Right, I haven't read it. I read the summary of it so far. You know, I, the summary, but, yeah. But I just wanted to yeah. – can you share with the – Oh, okay. Um, first of all, maybe I should go back and say that there is a huge, huge gap between my last published book um, and, and the Midwife's Touch. And that has been a great difficulty for me, that last published book called Out in the Stars, the last of the Storyteller Trilogy, was published in 2001-2002. And at that time, um, my mother-in-law was showing definite signs of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And she and my father-in-law lived next door to us and all the other children, my husband's one of four boys, and they all lived many, many, many miles away. And so I began to go over each morning and take care of her. And at first it was just cleaning and, you know, doing the meds, paying the bills, that kind of thing. But eventually, as anyone knows, the 24-hour day became a 36-hour day. And she begged and begged that we would not have her put in a home. And the resources in the Upper Peninsula 20 years ago were much less even than what they are today. And that's much less than what they are in most cities and many parts of our country. Um, Sometimes it's easier to break your own heart rather than the heart of someone you love. And she was an amazing, strong woman. And so um, eventually we got to the point where, you know, she was she was about a year old, <laughs> you know, and needed to be spoon fed and, and all the different things that you do for a baby. And, um, and it just absorbed my life. And instead of having four to six hours a day to write, I had one or two hours a week to write. And everything I wrote was not good enough for publication. It was disjointed and difficult. And she passed away in 2007, and I continued caring daily for my father-in-law, who did not need as much care, but old school, you know, born Mm -hmm. in 1919, and the women did the work, and the men did not do the housework, and and life was very complex, and then... um, went into caregiving for my own parents. Um, And it wasn't until my father-in-law passed away about four years ago that I had time again and wasn't doing daily care anymore to write. And at that time, (laughs) I had been doing a lot of wishing and wishing so much um, that I could write again. And I remembered the game I played with um, my brother Bob I'm the oldest of five in our family, but Bobby and I were together, and there's a 10-year gap between Bobby and the next person in our family, our next sibling. And so uh, we used to play a game where we'd give each other one wish, and one day we were playing, and my dad said, I wish that every wish I wish would come true, (laughs) (laughs) which started a family conversation of what would happen to you if you really got granted that one wish, that every wish you wished would come true. And I began to think about a person who could grant grant wishes. Mm -hmm. And so um, the midwife's touch is about a young woman who has inherited an incredible gift slash a curse that when she touches someone skin on skin, you know, a handshake, you know, just a touch to the face, if that person is wishing for something adamantly, a physical object, then that person will, in the next day or two, receive that 
And um, it's a gift because someone could receive something very, very good. And it's a curse because where did that gift come from? And how did that happen? And when people find out that she can do this, what will happen to you? And this is set, I love historical novels, so I did a lot of research for this novel, and it's set during the Civil War in the very divided state of, um, and part before the Civil War and after the Civil War, the very divided state of Missouri. My grandpa was raised in Missouri, and so I grew up with his beautiful southern Missouri accent, and I grew up with all the Ozark superstitions and ideas and sayings, and um, so that's the background, historical background. So this is a thread of fantasy set in a very strongly researched, accurate historical novel. So is the release date still scheduled for February? Pardon? Is there yes. re- okay, February good. the 7th Perfect. Um, is the pub date, 2023, and it started out to be this last July. And um, my publisher, Open Road, one of the vice presidents read the book and said, oh my goodness, <laughs> we're going to do more of it with this book than what we intended. And so that set back the pub date and uh, my distributor, their distributor is Ingram. And Ingram, somebody read it in Ingram and they did the same thing. They said, we're going, we're going to push this on. So um, February is coming out. Wow. You know, a couple of things that I think I want to capsulate real quickly. Number one, when we see people from the exterior. We read their novels, we read their works, we see the art they've created, or we see them on the on the big screen or the television. We don't realize people like that also have to do the things like take care of their, their elderly parents or you know, we don't we don't see that that third generation or that third dimension of a person who has, you know, six critically acclaimed national or uh, bestsellers. We don't see that side. So I think a lot of us can say, wow, we all, no matter what level of success we've had with our professional life, we still have to do, we still do normal things. People still do normal things. And I think that's, you know, you and I talked a little before the uh, uh, recording here and you said it's extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that's exactly why guests like you are the perfect fit for the Bamboo Lab podcast, Sue. Thank you. And the other thing you said that I, I really liked, and I was, as you were talking, I was taking notes and thinking about uh, this young, in the midwife's touch, this young woman inherits this gift slash curse. And so many of us in life have that. We have a gift that is also can be a curse. And for a lot of us, it's the, it's the thing we're, we're best at in this world. And if we can, you know, we are put on this earth to do this one thing better than anyone else, or we are put here to really have an impact on others. And if we mold that properly, it is a gift. But sometimes when we use it incorrectly, it becomes a curse. Or if we don't really harness its strength, it can become a curse. And I'm not saying that's the premise of, of the midwife's touch, but that really dawned on me right there, just that dichotomy that one thing can be both a gift and and a curse. It certainly can. It certainly can. And I'm sure you. I'm sure you. I'm sure you found that Brian in your life um, with the Bamboo Lab and with with you advising other people that sometimes you just feel like you have nothing more to give and um, you. You just need some privacy, you need some quiet, you need some silence. Um, My uh, son and daughter are both very much this way, and my daughter-in-law came from a very outgoing family, a wonderful family, that they're always active and doing things. They're terrific athletes, and I married into a family like that, too. The Harrisons are wonderful athletes and loud and boisterous and fun. And my family is quiet. <laughs> <laughs> we sit and read or we play music or whatever. But 
um, sometimes we need that alone time. And that's what my daughter-in-law said to me once. I finally realized, you know, that my husband, who is my son, her husband, um, needs alone time. And I need to give that to him. And I thought, wow, you were so wise. And they were only in their 20s, you know. Um, so there is that curse of giving to others and people kind of crowding you in. And yet, what a joy it is to be able to do that at the same time. It's just that sometimes you have to pull away and and have some private time too. Yeah, I, I, I always uh, share with the people around me that I'm a little overstimulated right now. I just need to, I need to kind of back into the cove for a minute and just re, re, regather myself. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, even Jesus Christ, you know, he said, I'm going to go up into the hills. <laughs> I'm going to go up into the hills and pray. I'm going to, you know, have private time. Um, you know, we have the right to do that. I have a friend who one day told me, Sue, you don't do a good job of setting boundaries. Mm. You let people... You do everything. You always say yes. You've never learned to say no. You need to learn to say no. And at the time, I was kind of th thinking, oh, well, how dare her? How dare she? <laughs> <laughs> she was so right. She was so right. And from that time on in my life, I began to work on doing that. And it, it, it's against my nature. But it's important for all of us. And I, especially, I think Sue, in this in this digital age that we live in, where we are overly stimulated by, you know, social media, cell phones, it we we were not created to have this type of stimulation on a consistent you know, minute by minute basis. Yeah. Sue, gro growing up and to become this amazing, uh, internationally acclaimed author, who was your inspiration growing up? Well, my mom. <laughs> The quietest, sweetest little woman you ever want to want to meet. About five foot tall, hundred pounds, dripping wet. Married this more outspoken, six foot tall guy, you know, and and she was always willing to take the back seat, and to the point that we didn't, we weren't aware of all her gifts. We knew she was an incredible pianist. And uh, so one day later on in her life became a, a gifted organist, and we knew she was a great mom. But there were a lot of things about her I didn't know, and I, just an example was um, I was one of those little kids with a great big singing voice, and so I began singing in front of audiences when I was about six, and I was asked when I was in my 20s to sing at a wedding. And the bride wanted Ave Maria, but she wanted it in Latin. Now, this was before Google, <laughs> before computers, and where do you find Ave Maria in Latin? <laughs> well, we found the music for it, and my mom was going to be the organist pianist for the wedding. And um, But there was no Latin. There were no... Latin words for the song. And I, I was married by that time, so I wasn't, you know, living with my folks. And I went over one day and to practice with mom. And I said, Mom, I cannot find the Latin words. I'm going to let down the bride. She's going to be so disappointed. I don't know what to do. And she just looked at me and she says, Well, honey, I'll translate it for you. I'm like, What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <Wow. laughs> well, you what? <laughs> <laughs> and it was something very quiet in her life that she loved languages and she had studied uh, and she had taken classes at the college level and at the high school level. But we found out she uh, she was uh, partially fluent, at least in, in five different languages. And she never mentioned that. I'm in my 20s. And every now and again, you know, we would have a little phrase we used that was maybe French or maybe German in our family, but we didn't go into where it came from. Or And yeah, she sat down and she translated the song for me into Latin and told me how to sing it, and I sang it in Latin and made the bride happy. And um, she was just this person who put everyone first, who was in awe of all the gifts of other people 
including the gifts that we often overlook. That lady who can bake the best cake in town, um, the person who knows just exactly what flowers to pick and what flowers to leave where they are because they're rare. All these things in other people she admired and always thought um, that others were so gifted, whatever their gift was. I, 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 that part right there resonates with me so much, Sue, because I think, you know, we tend to look as human beings, and I share this with my clients quite often, you know, University of California Berkeley study came out that substantiates many other studies that I've read sharing that we as humans, we have this little uh, amygdala in our brain, the size of an almond, that's de- it's there to, to notice threats and danger. And of course, in the time and era when your characters in the, in both of your trilogies were alive, that amygdala was necessary to look for, you know, threats from all par- parts of nature. But we don't have those daily threats anymore. So now we tend to look for danger where there is no danger. So we tend to notice the negative in people so much more because we have all this time on our hands. We have also all this safety in our, in our lives that we have to, our brain has to fabricate danger. And I just love what you said about your mother. She was in awe of other people's gifts. And if we could do that more often in society is to start looking because every person has a gift or, or multiple gifts. And if we can just look for yeah. those, maybe we would, we would, we would overlook the, the dangers that really isn't there from that person. I think that's perfect. I love that. I love what you just said. That's, that is such a, I've never heard that interpretation about our modern society of we're looking for danger. What? Oh, wow. That's going that. to definitely inform my writing and my thought process. Wow. Thank you for that. I'm very honored. You, by the way, Sue, I just had two dogs into my office. So one was right up at the microphone breathing and I was trying to push her away. So if you hear any breathing, one might bark and one might howl. But if it happens, I'll try to shoo them out of here. They're going to, they'll be seeing, they'll sense the deer outside or somebody will pull in a UPS truck and they'll probably bark. But that's just part of the authenticity of our conversation here. So. That sounds great. I was worried about that with my own dog too. When she left my office, she's usually my office assistant, but she is in the living room now and I have the door shut between us. So hopefully if UPS comes. Oh, it doesn't, it won't matter. <laughs> they always bring bit. her a dog biscuit and she's so excited <laughs> when it's UPS that she does. <laughs> yeah. Our, our, one of our dogs gets a dog biscuit and uh, is pretty excited. Uh, but now she can't because she's got some digestive issues. So now they can't leave her. Oh. We, we have to buy certain dog biscuits of a certain brand. So okay. they, I think they've stopped leaving the biscuits. So during the past two, two years in our, in our world with the quarantines and the COVID uh, struggles that so many people faced and our shutdowns and the solitude that we faced, what was your greatest learning through that process? I think I learned how selfish I am. Wow. Um, it was a horrible time. And we lost people in our community. And we had many options of what to do with our solitude close to us. Um, the greatest loss for me is I have a flower garden. And I absolutely loved it. And in our state, we were not allowed to buy flowers or anything and it broke my heart just broke my heart because I thought wow I can now I can't spend time in my flower garden because a lot of it is um was is container gardening Uh and I can't buy flowers for my containers and oh my word it, it I was just so sad about that and then all of a sudden I realized, and it didn't seem to make a lot of sense that you couldn't just go with and, and buy some flowers, you know? Um, <clears throat> and so I, I started looking around and saying, you are whining about not being able to buy flowers when you have one of your very good friends who uh, is at death's door with COVID now. What? on earth are you thinking, you know? And, and so I needed to turn my thoughts towards my friend, Lonnie, who was on a, on a, one of those, oh, I can't think of what they're called, respirators. Yeah. Anyway, in the hospital and 
I mean, the family was called a couple different times to come in. He survived. Okay. And it was just multiple miracles. But, and, the, and he wasn't the only one, and not everyone survived. You know, friends lost parents, elderly parents, et cetera. And I just thought, and I am all you know, thinking about, gee, I have more writing time. I have, you know, and sadly, I can't do my garden and poor me, poor me, and hooray for me, hooray for me. And I needed to get my thoughts off of myself. Honest to Pete, I was truly disgusted with me and start to think about others, um, try to be able to help others, whether it was to bring food, um, a phone call, a card. Cards turned out to be the very best thing for me to do. And, um, you know, prayers, good thoughts, just all of those things rather than focus on me, the very selfish me. Wow. That was not the answer I expected to get from that question, but very profound. Oh. <laughs> Shows a lot of self-reflection. So uh, the next people have a tendency to do <laughs> I don't know. No. Anyway. I think I you're I wonderful. Would. Even for even for going that direction and that self-reflection to admit to yourself how selfish you were at that time tells me that you're not cons uh, you're not a selfish person overall, and it made me think of how I behaved during the time of the of the shutdowns and the quote and the quarantines, and it made me wonder. Hmm, I wonder how selfish I was during that period. I have to I have to go back and reflect on that a bit. Sue, so the next question I ask is is the one that tends to be sometimes the most challenging for my guests. So you can answer it or choose not to. But what is the most difficult thing? you've ever gone through in your life and how did you overcome that? Okay. Um, this is, this is a tough question. And for me, it's a hurtful question. Um, that's probably the wrong word hurtful, but it brings, it brings up some, um, extreme sorrow. Um, my husband and I married when we were still in college and we worked our way through thanks to his parents who gave us jobs in their, their meat company, I had a family meat company business. Uh, I washed hot dogs and uh, I was cashier and uh, my husband's first job was a butcher and from a young age. And we got through school that way. And when we got through school, we wanted to begin a family and uh, we knew my husband was going to be going to Vietnam. He, he was already a pilot, private pilot, and we knew he'd, he'd get into officer's training. He'd, you know, he'd be a lieutenant, and his life expectancy would be very short. And I told him, I said, you know, I really want a baby before you go. He had a low draft number, and his uh, his student deferment would be up at the end of the year. I finished college in three years instead of four, and I got pregnant, and we were so excited. And February 1970, you know where I'm studying now, 1772, um, 1972, <laughs> we had a beautiful baby daughter, Coral Christine. Unfortunately, at that time, in this area, in the Upper Peninsula, there was a plague of spinal bacterial spinal meningitis, and the, our daughter caught it, and she died. A little baby. That is a horrendous disease for anyone to have. Very, very painful to see a baby go through that. <laughs> it it just ripped our hearts out. And uh, we were 22 years old, and we had never lost anyone. I mean, I lost my one grandfather when I was eight, and we just had never lost anyone. We had, we had no losses. I mean, my great sorrow in life was that I didn't make it on the cheering squad when I was a senior. You know, <laughs> talk about a charmed life, you know. And so as we, fortunately for us, it was closer together in our marriage to share this sorrow. And fortunately for us, um, 
a month before my husband, three weeks before my husband was going to go to the Army, uh, the draft stopped, and he did not get drafted. Um, so all of a sudden we had a, a normal life staring us in the face. But there was just this great, great, great hurt. And I, I went through times of anger. I, you know, the steps of sorrow, everything you go through. We had a lot of family support, um, support from friends. Um, I didn't know anyone else who had ever even lost a baby. And um, most of our friends, you know, have little kids. You're in the UP, you marry young, you mm-hmm. have your family when you're young. And uh, most of our friends had, had children before we did. And I finally decided this. And, you know, we really grew spiritually, too, just leaning on God to get through each day, each hour. And I finally thought of this. Okay, what is the worst disappointment I have for Coral? Well, it was that she could not um, have a positive impact on people's lives on earth. And then I thought, now, wait a minute. She can have a positive impact, but only through me. She she can't do it herself. She had a. She, I can let her impact on my life, make me a more loving, more caring, more understanding person, or I can let her have a negative impact on people's lives on earth by being bitter. And do I want that bitterness to be my daughter's legacy? No. I want it to, I want her to be a blessing. So I need to be a blessing. Wow. And you know, God blessed us with two more healthy children. <laughs> when our son was born, I remember saying, Lord, this baby cannot even have a hangnail. <laughs> you know, please, nothing wrong. And we then have two very healthy children. And, and you know, they're still with us. They're in their 40s. They're still with us. And still well, blessed and healthy. It's. I'm so sorry that you and Neil had to go through that. And what the, you. the strength that... When you said that, um, her, your daughter's name was Coral? Yes. Okay. We are into scuba diving. Okay, okay. I'm going to make sure I pronounced her name correctly. That You had to decide. Your, you, you took this tragedy and you found that piece of gold wisdom that was in that, linked into that tragedy, or buried into that tragedy, and turned it into something so beautiful that you wanted, you at first were feeling that you were upset and hurt and saddened because she could never have a positive impact on the world. But then through that, you realize, yes, she can. It's got to be through you. And it can either be a positive, loving impact, or it can be a a, a negative impact. Uh, type of impact. And I have a feeling, this is my belief, not everybody shares this belief with me, but I believe that Coral is up there right now looking down and saying, that's my mom right there. That's my mom. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, I believe she's up there too. I hope she's proud of us. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine she's not proud of both of you. I mean, you definitely have taken, you, you have used uh, through you, you've allowed her to make an amazing impact on the world. Because I know so many people who have read read your books and have had such a big impact. It's one of the few books I've ever gone through and read. I'm on. I started. I read the uh, storyteller and then the uh, the Ivory Carver. I always, I, my, I always go by Mother Earth, Father Sky as the first trilogy. I always think of that. But I read both trilogies and came back and read the first trilogy and then started on the second one about two months ago. So I wanted to make sure I kept it going. So every once in a while I pick it up because if not, I'll forget the characters' names and how, how they're linked. Oh, but I understand that. I've never read a trilogy <laughs> twice and I've read bo- your first one twice and I'm on the, on the second one for the second time now. So, but Thank you. What do you consider, Sue, in, in life right now, what do you consider to be a victory, a triumph for you? Oh, Hmm. Wow, that's a tough one. Um, a triumph for me is to um, is to see the beauty in each day. 
whether it's a good day or a bad day, you know, and to see the beauty, to look beyond. And um, it came to that when I was doing the daily care for my my in-laws. Um, those were tough days. I never knew what I was going to face. And I had to walk from our house to my in-law's house, which is basically, what, 100 yards up the most, less than that. And finally, I, I was waking up and saying, oh, no, another day. Oh, no, another day. And uh, my father-in-law was a wonderful, giving, generous person, but very volatile. And so I didn't know, okay, is he going to be angry today or is he going to be preaching at me today? Um, is he going to be afraid today because he had many fears? And uh, what do I face? And I, uh, I'm the kind of person that wants to know. You know, my husband's always teasing me and saying, yeah, okay, so what are we doing in 2030, May 1st? <laughs> you know, and um, <laughs> I had no way to know what my day was going to be, and so finally I just thought, "Wow, I'm getting so down." Um, and I prayed. I said, "God, I need, I need one small beautiful thing to see on my walk between <laughs> my house, my back door, and my my mother-in-law and father-in-law's back door. Some small." Sometimes it was just this tiny little white flower at my feet or a snowflake, maybe a squirrel, um, sometimes just the reddest maple leaf you ever saw in your life. But there was always something. There was never a day when there wasn't something beautiful to start that day. And if I can remember to start my day with something beautiful, then that's a win for me. I think that is so great. What I want to, an exercise, Sue, I've done with many clients, especially those who have a tendency to see the negative in other people, as we mentioned earlier, is I always tell them, when you go home from work tonight and drive home, I want you to count how many blue cars you see. And they'll say, why? <laughs> so they'll do that. The next day, it's always yellow cars. And then when they come back two days later, I say, okay, when you were counting blue cars that first day, how many yellow cars did you see? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then I do this some exercise. And the idea is we see what we're looking for. And oh, my goodness. It, so it's such a great exercise to open our eyes up. And I really try to teach my clients and loved ones, and I, I do this, but I don't do it as, as as consistently as I should, is every morning for quite a while, I would get up and I would write three things that I'm grateful for at that moment. It could be the cup of coffee in my hand. It could be the dog laying on my, my lap as I'm reading. It could be anything. And that tends to set my mind and my eyes and my ears to be searching for things to be grateful for the day. You really switch that you know, because that amygdala in our brain wants us to see nine things for every positive, for every one positive thing it sees. It kind of shifts that equation a, a bit to help us to see more of the positives because we are naturally wired to see the negative. We have to work, work to see the positives. And that's exactly what you did. You simply reframed and rewired your brain by looking for that one, sometimes that could be the smallest white flower in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. And that. Yeah. Now I know why we look at the negative, though, because it's a survival mechanism for for us through the eons. Well, you know? yeah. I did not know that before, Brian. I love that that you brought that up. <laughs> I, I just love it. You are most welcome. Well, and you think about like the characters in your two trilogies. I mean, they had to have that amygdala going strong because they were wolves and oh, bears yes. and typhoons yes. and uh, you know other other bands trying to come over and uh, and take over and kill them we don't have that anymore at least in the, in the, in, the, in the vast majority of the world anyway the developed countries we right. probably don't have that so that amygdala still wants job security it still has something to do so it just creates danger you know <laughs> i don't job security yep that's it that's true that is so true you know yeah. we ha we live in this world where we have so many um irrational fears and the exercise I started with some clients in the fall, I did it myself and it, it changed my life. I, I didn't do it every week. It became a little burdensome because, but every Monday morning I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and I would tell my clients, find the most, the time of the week or day where you're most vulnerable, where usually that's Monday mornings for most people. And I say, sit down quietly and, 
ask yourself this question. If I could eliminate all of my irrational fears for the next seven days, what would I do differently this week? And I said, write down the first three things that come up. And I, you write them down and I say, now you go out there this week and you do those things. Whether it's ask that, 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 that young lady out who's in your math class or whether it's, you know, for me, one of them one week, Sue, was to tell my mother that I love her, to actually tell her not just love you, mom, but to stop in the middle of a conversation and say, mom, I want you to know how much I love, respect, and appreciate you. And I don't know why that would be fear-based. I don't know why, but there's some irrational fear in there. Maybe it's fear of rejection. And of course, my mother constantly telling me she loves me, but so I knew she wasn't going to reject me, but there was an irrational fear. So that week I did that. And she remembers because I told her about the exercise and she said, I remember when you said that on the phone, honey, I said, well, I, you know, this is why I did it. So that's just one of those things that you were just kind of reframing our brain to do these things that, and, and see the good in people and to try these things that are for the most part irrational and sometimes showing love to someone or gratitude to someone can be fear-based for us because we don't want to be rejected or embarrassed. So we we tend to hold ourselves away from from doing these things just because, you know, I don't think in the in the era of your characters in the trilogy series, they were not afraid of asking the girl out in their math class. They weren't afraid of, of doing the things because their brain, their fear was on real things. You know, they were afraid of wolves and, and bears and, you know, t- and typhoons Absolutely. and hurricanes. So now we don't have it. So we fear other things. I have a question. So you graduated from Lake Superior State in three years. So you were tw- were you twenty one when you graduated? I was twenty. You were twenty. Wow. So if you could go back right now, Sue, <laughs> we could jump in a, in a in a time machine. You and I could fly back to when you were twenty years old, and the current Sue Harrison could sit down and talk to the former twenty year old uh, self, and you're just graduating college. What would you tell her? What would you say? This is the recipe for success and happiness in this world. I think I would, now that I've talked to you, I would have, I think I would tell myself, um, am I saying it right? The amygdala? The amygdala, yeah, amygdala. Amygdala. Okay, about about that. And about that um, fear portion of our brain, how it was a survival mechanism, but we don't need it as much nowadays. And so we, like you said, for job security, because I was a very fearful person at that time, I was quite brave about some things, um, but others very afraid, mostly afraid to be with people for the first time, someone I did not know, very uncomfortable with that. And also afraid that my dream would not come true, that I would not become a novelist. And that was a huge dream for me. And I was, it was a huge hope. And my husband was so supportive of that. We dated in high school and he was so supportive way back then. And, um, don't be afraid to go for your dreams because it's all going to be all right. Don't be afraid of people. The worst they can do is just turn their back on you. And and that's not terrible. You can survive that. So I I think he would talk to me about fear. Oh, perfect. I'm just trying to write this down. So I'm not a very fast writer. That's okay. I'm not either. (laughs) But so the book midwife's touch comes out and I'm going to include a link to that. Um, as well as the other books and in the uh, the text of today's podcast. So other than that, I guess that, or, or including that, what's next for you? Well, um, much to my joy, the summer after um, the VP of Open Road Integrated Media, which is my publisher, read the book, she said, I want to know what happens next. Uh-huh. Um, is it possible that you would write sequels and so <laughs> the door was open and I had already been working on on sequel for it and realized that it was the third book not the second book I had skipped skipped too much in between and started on the second book but all the time saying yeah but if this first book doesn't do anything I've just wasted six months of writing time you know fear again just like we talked. So um, I am working on um, 
The second book, which the working title, which may very well be changed, is called The Midwife's Escape. And it is, the first book has a a thread of romance throughout, but the second book is definitely about a relationship she has with a very worthy person. And, um, And she is enslaved. She is enslaved by people who are seeking to use her power for their own gain, and she has to escape them. And that's kind of the end of the first book, although I wrote an epilogue that uh, said everything's happy now, you know, <laughs> so, but I'm, I need to write the in-between between how she was, she was captured by these people and how she gets away. So oh. that's going to be the second book, and that's what I'm working on. That is so wonderful. So for the Bamboo Pack out there, please, if you have not read any of Sue Sue's books, I would recommend starting with Mother Earth, Father Sky. That's the first Thank in the first you. trilogy. Um, that's if, if you want to go buy them all, they're on every major. You can buy them. I've seen them in bookstores all over the country. Uh, get on Amazon or your local bookstore and look for the Ivory Carver uh, trilogy and the Storyteller trilogy. But I think starting with Mother Earth, Father Sky is a great one. And please, Get on and pre-order the Midwife's Touch. Uh, I know I'm going to be oh, doing that, would be that right wonderful. away. Pre-order, Pre- is just pre-order. A drink. Yeah, let's get that thing ordered. Let's get people because I definitely what I had no idea what it was about other than you know just the summary that I'd read. What you've how you've explained it gives me so much more fascination and excitement to get that thing read in February when it comes out. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I can even, uh, what I'll recommend here, for those who haven't read Mother Earth, Father Sky, for the first 10 people who send a heart letter sharing with the Bam- well, us here at the Bamboo Lab podcast what this particular episode with Sue Harrison did for you, I'll send you a free copy of Mother Earth, Father Sky. For the first 10 who reach out through text, through Facebook message, Instagram message, uh, however you want to, email me. At Brian at Bamboo Lab 3.com. Look on our website. That's www.bamboolab 3.com. Look at that. Get on there. Share with me what this podcast has meant to you, and you'll get a copy of Mother Earth, Father Sky. If you've already read that, I'll find another one. Which I'll decide which one you haven't read, and you'll get a copy of that one. Thank you so much, Brian. Oh my goodness, that's fabulous. Thank you. Well, I want more people to. I want more people to have. Get the impact that myself and so many of my loved ones have had through your through your writings. So I'm doing it selfishly too because I want the world to experience this. <laughs> Thank you so much. You oh, are most you. welcome. So as we begin to wrap up, is there any question that I did not ask that you wish I had asked, or is there any last parting piece of wisdom you'd like to share with the Bamboo Pack? I think your questions were fabulous. I I felt like. I really did have the opportunity to explain to you um, my life and my dreams and and how that all worked together. Um, my advice to others is is simply to to base your life on on a very strong spiritual foundation. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to push that down anyone's throat, but. You have to look outside yourself. And then you have to look inside yourself and realize that you're worthy of your dreams. It doesn't matter if that dream is so huge that, you know, (laughs) honest to Pete, how can a little gal from Pickford, Michigan, who didn't know anyone or anything about the book world, didn't have any connections, suddenly have a, you know, a book that sells all over the world. And if, if I can do that, anybody can do that. You just have to not give up the rejections. I had five years of rejections on that book. After it, after I finished it, I was trying to find an agent. And I, I just felt like, you know, it, it was never going to happen. They didn't give up. So don't give up. Be willing to work hard and to believe in your dreams. <sighs> Okay, so I, I asked that question, and you acted like maybe that you didn't have a response because you feel like you've you've covered so many things. Then you hit us with that big bombshell at the end. Base your life on a very strong spiritual foundation. Look outside yourself, and then look inside yourself, and realize that you're worthy of your dreams. Don't give up. I, I, there's no better way to end this podcast. I can't imagine topping that. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. 
Sue, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and coming here and visiting us and allowing my Bamboo Pack listeners to really see the inner workings of an incredibly strong woman, author, caregiver, you know, mother, wife, grandmother. I mean, you are an inspiration. And I'm so glad that through all these years of me writing your books and following you on social media, meeting you one time, I don't even know, I think it was in Cedarville, Michigan at a little bookstore, a book signing. And and I got your autograph for my daughter. And it was a brief a little meeting. This is the first time we've ever been able to speak. And I hope it's not the last. I hope not either. This has been fabulous for me. Oh, it's Thank been amazing. So well, do you mind if we spend a couple of minutes after we uh, we stop recording here? Oh, that's perfect. That's okay. fine. Wonderful. I, 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 I cleared my schedule. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Well, I'm going to sign off here. Sue, thank you for being such an amazing guest on the Bamboo Lab podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Bamboo Pack members, please remember, get out there this week. Please uh, rate us, review us, hit that like and subscribe button. We really need those algorithms to continue to kick in and grow this podcast so that we can continue to bring amazing, amazing people like Sue Harrison to the world, to our listeners. Please share us with three other people this week. And in the meantime, please sculpt your life. I appreciate you all.